Yo, 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 live on location. Me and the blackest one are still here in Orlando, staying our asses at home. And today we got basketball slash WNBA royalty with us, y'all. We got Money Moan. Baton Rouge is on. She put it on the map on the cover of Sports Illustrated before she even touched the high school hoop. We are pleased to have with us today Miss Money Moan, Simone Augustus. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Man, we've been watching you since you was in high school, and you know, this this definitely is a blessing. And you know, we definitely thank you for coming on the show. Thank you. Brought to you by ATT 5G. All right, so the first question we asked everybody who come on the show is uh when you first made to the WNBA, who was the first person to bust your ass? That's a good question. I'm gonna have to say DT, Diana, Diana, um, or either Cappy, you know, we went one and two. So that game was like big. We went neck and neck. I don't even know what we ended up having in that game, but I just know both of them players was on the same team. That's a tough guard, like to have to deal with Diana on the wing, Cappy coming on the other wing, you know, them. Diana being able to shoot from anywhere, you know, being aggressive in her prime in her younger days, Cappy being able to one, two, dribble, pull, transition, three. Um, Big problem. Yeah, it was probably, yeah, it was probably one of them two players that might have, they might have hit me for about th- a 30 piece. I ain't gonna lie. <laughs> might have hit me for about 30 piece. And plus, I wasn't even on no defensive thing. Like, you know, my rookie year, I'm just trying to get some bucks. You really trying to be the, oh, yeah, no. yeah, you ain't trying to be the defense. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Baton Rouge, Louisiana. <laughs> like, like, who put that ball in your hand? Cause they said you've been you've been the one since anybody can be the one. Like, so who who started you off with that ball? Man, pops put the ball in my hand. Um, I tried many sports though. I tried tennis, softball, um, volleyball. I mean, you name it, I probably tried it. But like basketball. I just had a natural feel for it, like put the ball in my hand, able to shoot, able to dribble. And I just remember my first session when I decided like this was what I wanted to do. Pops was like, you want to be good? You want to be great? Mm. And I was like, I want to be great. And he was like, well, we got some work to do. And so, you know, we have a lot of money and nothing like that. So he just started like makeshift and stuff in the yard, took the lawn chair, made like a little obstacle course for me to dribble in, dribble through, took his belt, like tied up my arm. So I have to use one hand and not the other. He took my mom's bowling ball glove and put it on my shooting hand so that I can focus on like my arch on my shot and things like that. I don't know where he found like now it's a thing, but you remember the, the glasses that you prevented you from looking down when you were dribbling? Glasses, yeah. Where, did, where he got them from back then, I don't know, but <laughs> I had those. Any any and everything that he could find, he was using it for to help me get better on the court. And then I grew up playing on the gravel court so like you hit the ball the wrong way that gravel gonna take it so people like how you got your handles nice like playing on gravel like right. i didn't know where the ball was gonna go oh no <laughs> and you had to be aggressive with the handle so you know other than that he you know, his first my first intro to like studying was like the old school Pistol Pete, Dr. J, Iceman like I had a VHS tape of Pistol Pete when he was doing all his like no look passes behind the back, elbow passes, and all this stuff back in the day before like Jason Williams and all them guys started doing it. I was just watch that tape until I couldn't watch it no more and just go outside and just really get it in. Mm. At, at what age so early on would you say it really clicked for you where you knew that you were you were better than the rest of the kids that around your age and you were able to do some things that they couldn't? Man, very early, like maybe nine or 10 years old, when you was playing on the baskets that they had the hook to the big basket. <laughs> I just remember being there, yeah. I remember being in the yard and I was banging on our goal, like just dunking on it. My pop was like, you gonna tell up our goal, do it when you play this weekend in the game. And so we had to go through like the recreational um, facility, make sure I could dunk and all this stuff. And they allowed me to dunk as long as I didn't hang on the rim. And I just went out that first game and just banged on like one of the dudes in the gym and the whole gym like went crazy. And from that day forward, the gym at a bitty ball game, nine and 10 year old bitty ball game, it was like packed. That's when I first learned about like haters and people like coming booing you and stuff like that. They they never believed you was the right age. They won't see your birth certificate and all that, huh? 
Well, no, nah, they didn't care about that. It was just like a girl just banged on my son. Like, what's going on here? <laughs> At first it became, it was like funny, friendly, like, oh, you can crack jokes. And then it got serious, you know, like some of them gems can get rowdy. And so then that's like when your family get into it and it becomes like a protective thing after a while, just trying to make sure I'm safe and I'm able to do what I love without any problems, you know? Yeah. Right. To make the cover, Sports Illustrate to make the cover before you even play a high school game, like, like how is that? Like that's that's crazy. But to be honest, I mean, is she the, the next MJ though? Like, like yeah. what? Man, they put some pressure on me, didn't they? Like <laughs> I didn't even know. I honestly didn't even know. Um, they told me I was going to Tennessee to to do a shoot to meet Shamiko Holeslaw. And so I was just like, yo, I get me Holeslaw. You know, that's during the time Tennessee was doing their thing. They had the three Meeks, yeah. blah, blah, blah. So I'm just excited about that. I'm thinking I'm gonna get a little piece in the, in the inside of the magazine. And just so happened we made it to the state championship that year. One of my teammates had to go to Walgreens or somewhere for something and saw the magazine and brought it back to the hotel and was like, yo, you knew you was on the cover. It had no idea I was on the cover of this magazine. So of course, from that point on, it blew up while we was at the state tournament. So we made it to the championship game and we lost. Uh -huh. And the team that beat us, the coach said something slick, like, you know, I guess we should be on the cover of, yeah. you know, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Not a adult, not the coach. Yeah, so from that point on, it was like I had the biggest bullseye on my back because it's like, oh yeah, that's a girl in Sports Illustrated. But it helped me, like, though it was like, you know, it seemed like something bad, like, oh man, I got to deal with all this. It was actually good because it helped me hone in on my game and really focus knowing that no game, whether I was playing pickup or this was pro and whatever, mm -hmm. I had to bring my A game because people wanted to beat the girl that was on the front cover of the magazine. Yeah, I always love to hear stories like that because, you know, especially nowadays with the, with the, with the climate of the hoop culture and how these kids get so much crazy notoriety at a young age. They be seventh and eighth graders with a million, a hundred thousand followers on social media. So to hear somebody like you, that like you really was before any of this social media, any of this crap, like to be, before you even play high school, to be on a cover of Sports Illustrated and then you still be able to follow through and become, you know what I'm saying, make it to the WNBA. Cause you and I, all of us know that a lot of people that start off that early, sometimes they go to their head, sometimes somewhere along the line, they lose that passion or that work ethic or that drive for you to be an example of somebody that, you know what I'm saying, had it bigger than most people. It's not a lot of people that can say they was on Sports Illustrated at any point in their life, but you had it before high school and you still, you know what I'm saying, stayed on task and stayed on course and made it to be a pro and, and doing big things with that. That's a big major salute to you. That's a shout out to moms and pops because they made sure I stayed humble the entire time. He was like, you know, the little saying, you're only as good as your last game right. and, you know, stuff like that. And so I kept that in my mind. Also, just really seeing them make the sacrifices that they made to help me follow my dream. Like, you know, pops going going to work and having newspaper in his, sho in his shoes so that I can get new shoes to go hoop in or moms having a penny pinch and figure out how to get some in so that I can go to different camps and stuff like that. So I wouldn't want all those sacrifices to go to waste. Um, so I use that as motivation as well. Like I want to see my parents happy. I want to make them proud. So I really, you know, keyed in on what my goals were and what I wanted to do. Well, that's a big salute to the parents as well then because that's, that's a job well done. Right so you you grew up with a cup with a couple of players and stuff that made it to the league and you know what I'm saying had successful lives and careers. One of the players that you grew up around was Big Baby. When was the first time you met Big Baby? <laughs> Man, we and Big Baby kind of grew up together. Like when you use that saying, like it takes a village to raise a kid. Big Baby was that child. You know, he had a very challenging upbringing. And so everybody in the community saw what he could be and we just kind of like protecting him. But we would be in and out of gyms um, in our little neighborhood or whatever. And he got that nickname from the gym. <laughs> we would go there. He was the biggest kid in the gym. Of course you want him on it, on your team, but he was the softest kid in the gym. He didn't want nobody to touch him. He would always run. And he was the kid that would like take his ball and go home. And you're like, oh man, you big baby. And so it just like, you said it enough that it just started to catch on. And every time somebody saw him, 
he would you just like, hey, what up, big baby? And Lord, don't let us play against like adults. Like when we would have that that run where it's like the grown folks, he definitely didn't like playing against them because they were super physical with him. Like they ain't let him get no calls, like just tell him shut up. You know how I go, like shut up, you know, play ball, check up, you know. Uh-huh. <laughs> what you saw when KG ripped into him was what we saw from day one all the way to that moment. We was like, when we saw it on TV, everybody was like calling each other like, look at him, he ain't broke out of that crying yet. (laughs) (laughs) Big fella be so passionate. (laughs) Yes, oh my God. And And that's what got him to where he is. Like he worked really hard. You know, he's always had a good head about him. I mean, he listens, but he's always gonna be like emotional about whatever it is he's doing, so. Extremely emotional, passionate. Extremely. Yeah. I need to know the story that he told us about staying the night at your crib and your pops to this day say, y'all, he owe y'all a let out couch. He do. And I just told him I was about to do the interview with him. He was like, make sure you put on that. And he, I still ain't got the furniture truck here yet. <laughs> but um, <laughs> yeah, I remember that day started off like it was um, it was our family's time to like watch over Big Baby, make sure he got to practice and all the stuff that he had going on. And so I just remember the night before we went to church's chicken. Moms was like, what you want, Big Baby? He was like, I want a, he was like, I want a 10 piece all breast with uh mashed potatoes and biscuits. <laughs> Mine was like, what? 10 piece all breast. <laughs> I've all never breast. heard that order before. All breast. So, you know, mom was like, all right, cool. She ordered the 10 piece. Then we had to proceed to order us a 10 piece for our family of three to eat. <laughs> that was his meal. But, you know, get home, he smashed that meal. Like, believe it or not, he ate all 10 pieces of them chick- that piece of chicken, the biscuits, everything. <laughs> and then, um, mom told me, lay the bed out and everything, fold the sofa, sleep out, dress it up for him and everything. Now, normally on, the, uh, on any other weekend, big baby wake up one o'clock or close to the time you need to get up and go to practice or whatever. This morning, he was up at 8.30, 9 o'clock. So we was like, oh, you. You know, you up bright and early. <laughs> He's like, oh yeah, you know, fed him breakfast, took him on out the door. Come back, mom, like take undress the bed so we can wash the sheets. I fold the, the bed back, a stain this big on the bed. I'm like, feet <laughs> <laughs> on the bed. And she was like, you lied. So the whole family gathered in the living room. We just like looking at the bed, like <laughs> We couldn't R.I.P. The- to the mattress. <laughs> we tried everything to get them stains out of there, and, and it just didn't work. So we ended up getting rid of the sofa bed. And so from that day forward, pops would just be teasing him about it, like, "Yo, you peed in my, you peed on my sofa, on my sofa." And as we saw him climbing the ranks and going to college, getting ready to go to pro, pops was like, "For sure, you're gonna send me a sofa sleep at some point." <laughs> Whatever it is that Paulo Santo y'all y'all got going on here, brought the truth out. He finally answered. Yeah, so for sure, now Pop's just sitting back like, I better see a, a furniture truck at some point coming down this driveway since he didn't owned up to it. Yeah, yeah. man, that is. Hey, when he told us that story, man, I'm talking about, man, we cried. I think they had to edit some of the video we <laughs> laughed so long. Yeah, I'm like, he was like 10. 10, between 10 and 13 years old, you know, old enough to know, you know, old enough to get up and go to the bathroom. I'm like, bro, what happened? <laughs> he said he was nervous. <laughs> uh, it might have been all that chicken he ate <laughs> with his guts, man. That is too. <laughs> so you get to high school, you lose your first year at state. And then, you know, like, like the, the target is on your back. Like you got to perform every year. So after that, you start like running them off. Huh? Yeah, um, actually lost the first two years. And, you know, believe it or not, people don't understand. Like, I know I had the bullseye on my back, but I don't believe my teammates understood the pressure they had as well to perform. And so it, I, I can't do everything by myself. I can score 30, but if this, the other team's going 40, I need that other 10 coming from somewhere else. You know what I mean? And it took a lot of um, realization for them. Like, oh, they not just coming for us, for her, they coming for us too. So until that started to click, we didn't win no championship. It was just like a, a growing pains. It was lessons that needed to be learned prior to that. And once we as a unit got together and got on the same page, that's when we started like reeling off wins and doing like amazing things in, in high school. 
So, so tell me this, like I remember Big Baby also telling me, and also, you know, B. Bass, uh, Big Brandon Bass telling me that while they went on to be, you know, all Americans and all that, like you garnered probably more, more eyes and more, you know, they everybody was coming to the school to see you. You was more like the, the, the not the big man, but the big woman on campus around there while they were supposed to be what they was doing. Like they, more people was checking for you. Tell me how that was to be a female in that type of environment with other all Americans on the male side, but you garnering more attention and bringing more crowds than them. Man, you know, that was crazy. And we didn't even think like that. Like, you know, how society thinks of how they value women and men. Right. Like, that wasn't even a vibe at our school. Like, they just appreciated, like, good hooping, good ballers. Whether you play basketball, ran track or whatever, they just appreciated your greatness that you were showcasing at the time. And so they, you know, they was right in there with everybody else. We would have seven o'clock games and no lie, people would be in the gym when the bell rung at 2.30 to let, let school out fans was coming in to get a seat for the game. Like they had to start opening up the concession stand early and try to make that quick buck while people in there, I'm gonna make that quick dollar while they just sitting in there and we, I mean, we wasn't even in the gym. We would take like naps and stuff, meditate before the game. People, fans packed, it's packed in the gym, just waiting for a seven o'clock game. And it didn't matter if it was gonna be a blowout game or a big time game. People were just in there. And, um, you know, what brought me a lot of pride was the fact that it the, the high school was the center of our community. So it brought out a lot of the community. It brought out people that wouldn't probably wouldn't even drive through our community at some point. They brought people from all over. So that brought me more pride than anything, seeing everyone from all walks of life coming to embrace us in, in the hood. Like, I, I know it's a bunch of people from you know, different schools, different places that are like, uh, we coming through this neighborhood, <laughs> like right. smash ass, but they were actually coming to park the car and go on campus and watch a game. That that for me was was bigger than anything. They said y'all they said y'all campus was lightweight like a like a college already. Yeah, it was pretty big, you know. It it yeah, we housed what maybe eighteen hundred kids at the time, yeah. something like that, maybe a little more. So it was, I mean, that, that it was crazy. I wouldn't change those days for nothing. I remember running to the cafeteria. Uh, my grandmother used to work in the cafeteria like 30 years. So whatever they would tell us um, every morning on TV, they would run down the meals you're going to have at school for the day. We never had that meal. Grandma was in there cooking red beans and rice, uh, mustard greens, cornbread. Like, so this, that atmosphere, like people literally would come to our school to eat. Mm. Like from other jobs and stuff, they was like, we're gonna go over to Capitol High School and get a meal. Like they got good food up in there. Like so, oh, you know, those oh, memories. Oh, oh. <laughs> what? That's that real Southern right there. Yeah. Could it have been anybody else that could have got you outside of LSU? Somebody that almost got me. Um, To be honest, I wanted to go to Rutgers. Rutgers. And mm. I love Coach Stringer. Yeah. And Something happened with my visit, um, and I wasn't able to take my visit to Rutgers. Mm -hmm. And I was like, that might have been the game changer for me had I been able to take that visit. My homegirl from high school uh, went there, Natasha Pointer. She was from, from my high school, went there, play point guard. Then obviously, Cappy went after her. Exactly. So that would have been a time me and Cappy would have been on that team. That would have been crazy. That would have been a problem. <laughs> <laughs> crazy. Yeah. So now you get to LSU and you know you still got the, the target on your back because you know you you the next Jordan. <laughs> you know, so like how 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 is it when you first get to LSU and and just to adjust from a high school game to to a college game? I remember my first day at LSU was uh conditioning, 6 a.m. conditioning. They told us we had to meet at the indoor football facility. I'm thinking nobody told me no dress, no dress code, no what shoes to wear, nothing like that. So I pull out, um, what's the Jordan? Jordan, I don't know, the one with the spade across the top, the little, what is that, 16? Oh yeah, 16. 16, them the heavier ones out of the bunch of Jordans. So I pull out my Jordan 16s, I'm going to the, um, to the indoor football field. They said we were gonna run an indoor, uh, a suicide on the football field. And it had to be under three minutes. I died. I was like, I don't even know why I'm here. I don't know why. I'm here. 
that was the real day. I was like, what happened? You know, in high school, you had maybe a week with, you know, without the ball or something, do yeah, a couple yeah. sports eyes, real general, get to it. College is three months of just conditioning and, you know, three player workouts and stuff like that prior to the season starting. And I almost was like, you know, I, I, I just don't want to be bothered with all this. This is too much. We had the indoor suicides that, the, uh, and then we had 24, 100 yard sprints, like the next conditioning day that we had to make, the guards had to make it under like 10 or 11 seconds and the post was like 12, 30 seconds, something like that. I was like, this just don't make no sense. I don't need to be in that much shape. Like, <laughs> I, I really don't. I really don't. I, I hate it. That was the thing I hated more than anything. Yeah. Practicing or anything. When we had to run sprints, lines, miles, anything, 20 run around track. I hated that. I, I, track, I would always get sick. I would get sick the morning prior to like we going to the track because you never know knew what what it was gonna be. I remember one day we had a ladder. We went like 100, 200, 300, um, 400, and then back down. And when we got to the end, we was like, oh, okay, we cool. Coach Holler, mile. After all of that, he was like, "Mao." I was like, "Yo, he laughing. He he joking <laughs> right now." SpongeBob thing, like, yeah, I'm about to be out. <laughs> yeah. Couple <laughs> times I was like, "This college thing not meant for me." This this, but you know, now knowing what I know, when I talk to young young ballers, I'm like, college is meant to break you down to see what you're gonna do, like see how far you're gonna push yourself. Because a lot of stuff just didn't make no sense. But now when you look back at it, it's like, well, how bad do you want it? This is this is that moment. Like, so I'm glad I did, you know, have teammates around me, a coaching staff, and I just had that inner, you know, determination to want to just be better and push myself. So at what point, like when you got to college, did you feel like all right, after you got past all of the conditioning stuff, once you hit the courts, how did you feel? You felt like you you was right where you belonged, or you was on the level of everybody else, or you 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 was comfortable with where you was at. I was comfortable with where I was at. Um, I grew up watching LSU. I used to go, we couldn't afford to go be a season ticket holder and all that. So they had a pack the P-Mac, which was a dollar game. And they normally did the pack the P-Mac against their big time rivals like Tennessee or Georgia where they really needed big crowds. And so I would get to go and see them play. A lot of the girls I grew up playing with or against in AAU. So I was very familiar with them. And so once we got into practice and started playing games, it just kind of clicked. Like it was just, me um, assessing the situation, I always was like, man, one or two pieces, LSU will be, they'll be nice if they got a couple people. And, you know, when it was my opportunity to be that piece that they needed, I stepped in and everything just kind of happened. We just kind of started rolling and just kind of enjoying, enjoying ourselves out there. That was probably the freest I had been, um, you know, without any stress, all the stress that I told you prior to that point, even though it was still a lot of pressure, I was, at a point where I was just having fun, you know. I didn't get to ask how that how that run felt when you were at LSU to went run off those three years in a row. And what was it like when in the midst of y'all running that off, Sylvia coming through the doors to 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 be part of that? Man, it felt amazing, especially uh the first year we went on that run. That final four was in New Orleans. Mm -hmm. And so all we was thinking about, you know, in the locker room, every time we came in the locker room was a picture of the um the dome that we was gonna be playing in. And so every day we was like, we going to that dome, we going to the dome. <laughs> and we just worked at it every day. And I just remember uh what was it, Usher's Confession? <laughs> Confessions album came out that year. Yeah. Why that was that, like the team album, I have no idea. But when we made it to the final four, that was blasting on the bus while we had a police escort heading to, <laughs> to New Orleans or whatever. Um, you know, getting there, the second line, like, you know, if you ever been to New Orleans, you know, they they tell you don't ever stop people from second line. And that's like you know, if somebody was sleepwalking, you never wake up a sleepwalk, you just let them do their thing. And so we got there and this lady was um, working at the hotel and the second line band started playing. She forgot she was at work. She just started getting down, like just started getting down. And so, you know, we just remember those moments. It was bittersweet. Like we lost to Tennessee on the last, um, last play situation, but you know, to get there and look around and we had all this purple and gold, this big following and then that carrying on for the next two years, that was amazing. But, you know, Sylvia taking her visit to LSU was like, everybody stop all what you're doing. Nobody's going home for the weekend. We got one of the biggest recruits, you know, at this time coming in. We got to make sure she feel comfortable. And really and truly, like, Seal is so simple. 
I took her to Jack in a Box. <laughs> we got like <laughs> ultimate cheeseburger, some egg rolls, and a shake, and like just chilled out. And she was like, "I'm coming." Like I'm coming here. I don't know why y'all doing all of this, <laughs> but you know, make that known at the time. But she was just like. I already made my mind up. I'm coming here. And I remember when she came, she had sold us some pillows. Like, Seal loves ball, but she loves, like, doing knitting and things like that with her hands. And so I'm, like, this big old, like, six, six up in here knitting pillows right now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we knew at some point she was going to be in the paint dominating for us. Like, if that's what you want to do off the court, cool. Like, do your thing, but make sure you bring your A game when you get here. So now it was dope. To see Sylvia, like, like you kind of see in her career unfold and, like, she won the best centers ever to play the game. Like, from seeing her then when you, she was getting recruited at LSU to see her now being one of the best centers ever to play in the game. Like, how was that to watch her career and watch her blossom into that? Man, it was – it's kind of like seeing Big Baby. I remember when Sylvia get there and she was, like, real, like, soft and – you know, we had to just kind of like live it up to her and she'll catch it and put it in. Like she really hadn't developed her game when she had back to the basket game or whatever. To see her then and then to see her go through her Chicago days when we had to like, who go ahead and sell today? Like, <laughs> what are we going to do? We double, triple team? We're going to bring the whole team? Like, how are we going to do this? Because if not, you know, we're going to have a long night to then being able to play with her again and to actually witness it again like on the team in person like damn I don't have to just live it up to you no more I can give you a little bounce feed little one hand and she stepping off the block hitting them with the jump and stuff I'm like she never had that in her um package you know in school but I was just grateful to be a part of like witnessing her greatness and seeing her growth throughout the years yeah I remember when she first got to Chicago we were still working out at Hoops the gym and they was practicing there and I remember just watching her dunk and catch I'm like yo what is going on? Man. <laughs> she definitely came a long way. Yeah, I just wanted her to have a little bit more. I was like, man, why didn't God bless me with a little bit more height? Like, I wanted to be 6'6". Six, six. I would have tore this place down had I been 6'6". Six, six. Like, Seal could have dominated even more. Like, the dunking and stuff, she would do it, like, at practice and stuff. But I'm like, she did it once, I think, in a game in college, and that was it. But she could have did that on a regular, and I would try to bring that dog out her all the time. And she's just like, nah, I'm going to go knit pillows. I'm like, no. What did Nate Smith play of the, of the year? How did you feel when you won that? Man, a lot of them awards. So I never really, like, you know how people sit down, write down the list. I was never that player. Like, I, I just do the work. I get on the court, do my thing. And if who the the powers that be decide that I should win that award and I win that award. Um and it's all it was always a shock to me because I'm looking across the board at the talent that I'm playing against and who's around the nation and I'm like it could be any anybody any given night. And for them to, you know, award me that award, I was just like, yo, like I you know, I really didn't have words to express, you know, how I felt. Still don't. Like I really haven't had time to sit down and just look at my trophies and really assess all the success that I've had throughout my career because as you know we just it one thing to the next. So um you know just being able to to now know that you know you bringing this up I'm about to go in the living room and like really like sit there and really observe it because I really hadn't had time to process a lot of the stuff that I've done. Oh well shit you can do some shit. That's me listening. <laughs> did some shit because Man, like what you did down there, it's like they ain't never seen that before. It was, it was it's time you changed the whole environment for for women hoop down there. Like that's that's just that was, crazy. Yeah, that was my goal. You know, as like going back to uh, high school, like you know, I ain't I didn't get to go to a lot of camps. I wasn't on a travel team like you know the kids have today and all that. But the camps that I did go to, I noticed that I was the only person from Louisiana there. And so I prided myself, like, if it's the first and the last time somebody going to see a baller from Louisiana, then I want them to remember me. So I would always go out there. And that just kind of trickled into, you know, college, pro, international basketball. Like, if this is the first time you've seen somebody who from Louisiana, then I want this to be your best experience. I want you to understand that it ain't a lot of us out there, but... Where we come from, we got a lot of heart, we got a lot of determination, and we got a lot of like work ethic, and we gonna we gonna bring out all, you know what I mean? 
Yeah, now that's, I mean, even aside from the awards, so just the respect, you know what I'm saying, from, from when I would talk to Big Baby as my teammate, you know what I'm saying, him and Brandon Bass, it's funny, I had both of them with my teammates in Orlando, but they, just the way, just to hear them talk about how you were the real superstar there in the city, in, in, in the school, amongst two kids that both went McDonald's and did big things, that both went pro and all of that. To hear them say that, that lets you know from a different light that, you know, you got the respect of the guys and it's genuine. This ain't in front of nobody. This us just hanging out, chilling when it ain't nobody impressed or no capping going on. It's like they they telling true stories about the crowds, everything you just said. So that's 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 amazing. You know what I'm saying? I mean, beyond when you sit there thinking and looking at the trophy, you think about that too. Like, you know what I'm saying? You, the respect of our peers, we want that more than anything. Mm-hmm. And and especially from those guys, like seeing that process, like I was there, you know, when Big Baby was trying to decide whether he was going to play football or basketball. We all knew he was going to play basketball because he didn't want to take them hits in football. Like that wasn't happening, but he could have very well went, you know, in football as well. If you pull up some of his um, YouTube, some of his footage from high school, he was dragging the whole team in the end zone, you know, and Bass, to be honest, Bass didn't really get a lot of looks until his junior going into his senior year year and so to see he really pulled the LeBron on us like you know rookie year LeBron and then beast mode LeBron like the next year just got in the gym and got the work in Bass did that his junior to senior year and just to see him kind of blossom and grow and to have that respect we all was at LSU we went to the final four together we had that year where both teams went to the final four and shared that like you know that was amazing especially like you know from us we grew up together we seen each other go through struggles together we we dreamed about being here, like, you know, laughed about being here and not even knowing how we was going to get here. And here we are, like everybody fulfilled their, their goals and dreams or whatever. So, you know, that's that's the biggest thing. Nah, that's super dope. And LSU retired your jersey. Like for your jersey to get retired at LSU, how does that feel? Man, you know, I had to reflect on like when I made my decision to come, I sat down with a lot of um, elders. And they would tell me about times when they couldn't even come on LSU's campus. And so they was like, yo, you know, you broke down some barriers. You know what I mean? Like, we came down there for you. And to see a sister get her jersey hung in in an arena that we, at one point in time, couldn't even, you know, sit in or be a fan of or nothing like that. It was just like that racial divide down here. They was like, you know, thank you. And, you know, I was like, I didn't even think about it, but, you know, your elders always have that knowledge and wisdom that um, you need to tap into. And so from that point, I really felt proud because it was so many, you know, of my ancestors and the elders that was just so proud. Like, you know, one of us made it up there. I don't, they didn't care, male or female, like all of that was out of their mind. Like this sister made it, she lived out her dream. She made us proud. And that's how I felt with my jersey hanging up there. That's what's up. That's what's up. So now we go going to the draft. Ask the mm-hmm. famous qu- draft question, Q. Oh, oh, what are you talking about, the bag? No, about the, what you, with your dress, how you gonna get dressed. Yeah, yeah, so, so, so you, cause nah, yeah. First of all, before you even get to that point, just, she already going to the, you know what I'm saying? She in the green room. She ain't, she ain't like me. She ain't teetering on the edge of insanity. Like, am I going to get invited? Am I going? What pick am I going to be? She, 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 she first class. You know what I'm talking about? She top flight, seat of the world, Craig. She said, she already know. It's already known that you was going to be number one. All your, probably your biggest worry was your outfit, right? What, what you going to wear to the draft, right? No way. Now my biggest, I, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know if I was going one or two. It was me and Cappy, and it could have went either way. Um, and even my the, coming down to the outfit, I we was at the Final Four that year, and back then the draft was the next day after the Final Four, so you really ain't have that much time. Obviously, you see, I'm a tomboy at heart, so <laughs> I don't know nothing about no you know business casual clothes, what you supposed to bear, wear or whatever. So we go to Ann Taylor, and I'm like looking for stuff in there that can fit me. Obviously I'm taller than the, the normal average height of a woman. So everything was hard. So I just kind of, you know, put something together to, to go to the draft. What you saw was the best that I had at the moment with the time that I had. But, you know, my concerns were just, 
getting drafted. Even though I know I was going, I didn't know if it was going to be Minnesota or Phoenix at that point. Really and truly, I didn't care. I didn't like, you know, like you guys probably research where they going, who's there, what's going on. I just wanted to get drafted. Like, I just wanted to be in the league. I didn't care if one or two, I knew I was going to do my thing once I got in there. So, yeah. So officially to go number one, how did that feel? Like you the number one pick in the WNBA draft. That felt good. I got to hug my parents. I got to, got to hug my dad. Like he's my biggest critic. So that was one moment where he gave me some props. Cause other than that, he like, oh, I could have had a 100% game from the free throw, 40 points, this, that. He got something to say. And that was the one time he was like, baby girl, you know, you did good. Like we made it to number one. Now, once that was over, then it was like, well, now it's back to scratch. Like you got to prove why you was number one, but I was I was excited because I got to share that moment with my parents. My grandmother was there who also supported me throughout my time and my great aunt um, was also at the table with me. So to be able to go up there and, and finally get that relief off and hold a jersey with um, the president of the WNBA, I yeah. felt good. Yeah, everybody remember them draft days. Them draft days is amazing. It's like you, you go up another tax bracket. You always remember the day you go up another tax bracket. Well, you all go up another tax bracket. <laughs> You all go up another tax break. My parents still had jobs and I was still trying to figure out, you know, save my little pennies, put it to the side. So. I feel you, I feel you. Hey, let, let me ask you this. So you you hit the ground running your rookie year though. Like not not a lot of people get to say, you know, I, I came right in, set right on the scene at the All-Star. How, how was that for you? Like how did how did you feel going into the All-Star break and knowing that you're you gonna be, a, you know, you part of the All-Star team as a rookie though? Yeah, I felt good about that, you know, individual boards, but team wise, we I don't even know if we had our first win by then. Like we you know what I mean? So I was always a team player and I was kinda, you know, even though I was happy about being an all star going in my rookie, year, I was disappointed that like my college coach was like, Hey, congratulations on your first win and it was right before all star break, you know. So um you know, I just wanted to embrace the moment. Obviously, I was out there with some of the greats, with Swoops and Lisa and Sue. And, you know, I mean, you name it. Um, I got a chance to be in the Skills Challenge and won that year. So um, that brought a little light he back to the You had 16 points, led the team to score, too. Yeah. I, I mean, did we win, though? I ain't get the end. We ain't win. So that 16 went down the drain. I <laughs> hate when that happened. Like, as a hooper, you go out there, put, lay, your, lay your game down, and then your team losing, and then... It's just like you a little right. That could have been that, that y'all won. That could have been an MVP, maybe if y'all won. You feel me? I feel you. Look at that. But now nah, you know things happen the way they should, and I was able to at least get something and go back and use that to kind of celebrate back in Minnesota, and also use that as motivation to keep going. You you scored a lot of points your your rookie year. When did you it, it click to you like, oh yeah, I'm finna I'm finna get buckets every night yeah. ever <laughs> is guarding me. Cause you 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 came out aggressive like your rookie year and you was buckets. They said the, the next you was a, at least 400, 500 points more than the next person <laughs> on your <Yeah>. team. <laughs> You were telling me something I didn't even know. I was just out there getting buckets. See, in college, we ran a motion offense. So it, it basically went off of what the other player did and you made your moves or whatever. And I did fairly well in that system. But then pro style, you know, we run a few plays, but then they'll put you in some ISO situations where you can get down. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I got, you know, I got called in ISO situations more more than enough times where I got I got a chance to get busy. And at the time I was playing a three. So I was quicker than most threes, so I can utilize my footwork. Like they always call me like baby mellow, how mellow catch you in that little Yes, little man. Yeah. So I give them a little shot fake, get around them and get to the post, get to the goal or whatever. I pull up for my jumper, like, you know, everybody's like, your jump was lethal because it opens up the floor for me. Like, how do you guard a person that has a, a, a great jump shot? Like, baby you know how to guard it. Yeah, you know how to guard a three point shooter. You run them off the line. You know how to guard a driver. You, you close out short. How do you close a jump? How do you, you know, defend a jump a jump shooter? People really hadn't figured that out because before me and Cappy, I don't know if there was, um, you know, players in the league that was scoring in that range consistently like that. No, that's a great comparison, baby Melo. That that's exactly that's 17, 18 foot area is, you know, obviously in our game, they don't talk about it that much as as much anymore, but that boy was a murderer, and so were you in that in that area. 
So the year you tore your ACL, like how was that for you? That was the first time you ever had a real injury like that? Yeah, everything after everything before that was just like little ankle sprains and stuff like that. Yeah. And you know, now I'm into meditation, affirmations, like speaking, you know, things that I want positively into existence. Because I remember when I came out of the game, like we were in Phoenix, we were playing, we got back in the game. And so coach tried to give me a little break. And as soon as I sat down, got some water, they went on a run. And so I remember the coach was like, come on, get back in. And I literally, I was like, damn, when I'm going to get a break? Like, <laughs> That was the thought that came in my head. And then the possession of two later, I tore my ACL. And it really, like, it messed me up. I didn't really think I tore my ACL, to be honest. I was like, oh, I just, you know, dislocated my kneecap. Pop it back in. I can go back out here and do my thing. And I was like, nah, I'm on, like, you're done for the season. And so that's when, like, the mental injuries are more mental than it is physical. Your yeah. body heals. Your, your mind plays games on you because every day is different. I go, I went in, um, Sydney Spencer was a young lady that I spoke to. She had previously to her ACL and she was like, mom, I'm gonna give you this advice. Set a goal for yourself every day you go into therapy. And she was like, some days you're gonna achieve them goals, some days you won't, but no matter what, try to push for that goal. And so that's what I did every day. If it was just trying to get knee flexion, if it was trying to stand up on one leg balancing, like I would try to go as long as I could, or, you know, surpass the time that they gave me, things like that. So I kept myself, I guess as an athlete competing with myself mm -hmm. that e eventually, you know, it helped me heal and get over my hurdle. But to be honest, it wasn't until that same play happened to me that I was able to get over that fear. So once I did get back on the court, we were at practice and I made the same move, drove to the bucket the same way. And one of the practice guys kind of like bumped me. And once I like went up for the shot and came down at that moment, it was like, Oh, I'm good. Right. Yeah. No, so at that point I was like, I'm back. Straight up. So when you come back off that surgery, now you got weapons. You got <laughs> Nancy Whaley, you got Mike Moore, you got Brunson. Like it's it's not the same old team it was when you got hurt, but now they didn't when it got strapped up for you. Like how did it feel to kind of have that, that star power around you and, and girls to play on a higher level like you? Man, that felt good. Like and people, you know, when we went on our run with the links and everything, people was like, y'all cheating. No, no, no. I'm like, I went through, what, four years of losing where we only won 10 games a season. So there wasn't no, oh, we plotted a plan. Like, nah, the, the stars aligned and we was able to get Maya. Trades happened. We was able to get Waylon Bronson. Or actually, Bronson was through the dispersal draft when Sacramento folded. Yeah, things just happen and we look around and it's just like in your league, you look around at great teams, but sometimes them teams don't come together like you think they should. And the first week of practice, we going head to head. We didn't do anything with the practice guys. We just went mano y mano. Like it was just us, uh, shell drill, defensive drills. Like, and you just saw people like, Let's go, like getting after it. Like, you know, Maya over here talk you like, she ain't really talk no trash, but she had a look like when she jade you up, she'd be like, mm-hmm. Like wailing in there. Like it was, it was the intensity of that team, the tenacity that we play with on the defensive end. You got a prime Bronson that's just a rebounder, just boarding everything. Um, we just we were just able to play free. And to to be honest, I think at that point, Bronson hadn't been to a final since her time in SAC. Um, Way hadn't been to a final since her like early years in Connecticut. I had never been to the playoffs. Maya, Maya had just lost the um NCAA championship. So we were hungry, like we had something to prove, and it just all came together in eleven and it was amazing. It was amazing to feel like. Y'all was so deep. Then y'all get fouls, and it's just like, man, they, they can't be stopped. Like, mm -hmm. like that's just, that's one of the all-time <laughs> great teams ever, and you to be a part of that with so many great women. Like, I was like top five in every position. Man, I mean, that's, yeah, that's crazy. Like, I didn't even think we would get sealed. Like, I never imagined being able to play with Sylvia again in my career. Like, I'm just like, nobody's getting rid of her. And the opportunity came, and we had already got, what, two prior to her coming. And we was like, oh, snap. 
Like we could probably go get four or five at this point, you know, health, you know, how God say the same, we could do some things and was able, when she came in in 15, it was the last two weeks of our season. So we didn't even know how well she was going to mesh with the team, but still came right in and did what she does all the time. Like do her thing. She just dominated the post. And we were, <laughs> Domination. So just, get that shit out of here. Don't come down here with that. <laughs> so the stress that other teams had, Waylon coming down the floor with the rock, facilitating everything, me and Maya flying the wings, Seal and Bronson in the post. I couldn't imagine having to scout that game and who gonna guard who and what we gonna do. It's like most teams would be like, all right, in y'all situation, just say let James Harden get 60, we're gonna stop everybody else. Yeah, that wasn't it with us. It ain't gonna work with y'all. <laughs> ain't gonna work with y'all. Let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. The way Waylon played, like how she was, she was, she always pushed the pace. She always looked for her, her teammates and try to get everybody involved. Did it make it easier for you and Maya to coexist since y'all was so dominant scoring wise? Yeah, I would like when I talk to young punk guys, I'm like, go watch film of Lindsay Waylon. Waylon understood the game beyond like the normal, like, oh, come down one, everybody set up. I passed, I cut. Like, no, Waylon was like three or four steps ahead of everybody. She knew when we was gonna run two for play. She knew when we would, we needed to pick up the pace. She knew when we needed to slow it down. She looked, she saw matchups, like as she was coming on the court, like, oh, she guarding my, let's run this for my real quick. Oh, y'all playing it like that? We're gonna go over here. Like all of that in the process of the game, she was definitely an extension of the coach. Like sometimes she would go over and talk to um talk to Reeve, and what she was saying was what Reeve was thinking. So, you know, like when you got a point guard that's on top of her game to that point, it's easy for us to cause it. All we got to do is run the play, run the pin down, come flying off of that thing, mm -hmm. and she gonna get you to rock, or you know, whatever the situation may be. So it was it was amazing playing with a she got a that Steve, she got that Steve Nash mutant power. Yeah, like, the know, IQ. They part of the yeah. X-Men crew. She got the Steve, mm -hmm. Steve Nash mutant. They got the same mutant power. Knowing Maya and knowing how much she, how good she is and love to play this game, how was it for you to, when she made a decision to stop playing? Knowing that I still could have been good and still can compete for championships and, you know, yeah, the selfishness in me is like, man, you know, I wish that she would come back. But then, you know, the, I guess the humanness in me is just like the, my soul within is like, she was following a passion of purpose. And now we know, you know, her and this, uh, her and uh, Mr. Irons were actually like together. And so that makes sense now, you know what I mean? But it was hard to digest at the moment because it's like, no, we can possibly get one more, <laughs> but you know, when that calling calls and when you're, when it's time for you to fulfill your purpose, then I understood it. Obviously she had conversations with all of us, the starting five and everybody to explain what journey she was about to go on. And at that point, all we can do is really like respect it and then support her, you know, on our way. And, you know, thankfully, um, you know, her movement met his moment, you know, now with everything that's going on and he was able to be released, they were able to get married and I'm quite sure babies are sure to follow. Um, but I'm happy for Maya because she seems really happy. We know, like I got to witness the pressures that she went through playing, having to be great every day, every night, on the court, off the court, like, you know, having, she couldn't really go anywhere. I remember her first year, you know, it's supposed to be like at the hotels, you know, security, da 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 da. You know, you had the people that was dropping our food off, leaving cars to be signed for her and stuff like that. So I, I respect like she did everything that she could have did as a women's basketball. She done won everything, every possible award. It, it, I mean, I don't know what else it is that people want her to prove or show, but yeah, you know, she's happy and I'm happy for. Her. Yeah, I definitely know y'all proud of her, and especially to see it all unfold and, and come on out. Like, I definitely know y'all proud of her and what she grew to. Like, you know what I'm saying? All the fights that she is, you know, she took the world by storm. Y'all was one of the most dangerous combinations ever to be put together. Like, and that just ended like that, you never know. But, you know, we all as a basketball community is proud of her. Yeah, for sure. What was the temperature of the team when when y'all when y'all lost to the field? 
Cause I know y'all was like, once y'all get y'all won that, y'all won and y'all like, oh, we finna run these jumps off. Like, <laughs> like it's no brain that we finna kill everybody. So like, how was it when y'all y'all got there and then y'all lost? Cause it take it's, it takes, you know, it takes a lot for teams to sit here and compete at the highest level. Y'all went to championship, championship, championship at the championship. And you know, the whole <laughs> league is trying to take y'all down. So yeah. it, it takes a lot of focus to continue that. But what was the team like? when y'all lost it. Yeah, believe it or not, we, we had never repeated. So we didn't know the pressure of repeating. Like every game that year was tough. Um, and Indiana hit they stride in the playoffs. That was the the good and the bad of our playoff situation. I think we converted over to what the new format. I'm not sure at this point, but we had a lot of rest in between that series. Well, Indy was rolling and came right into our series rolling as well. And they were a very physical team. They really got after us with Tamika Ketchings leading them with, on the defensive end of the, and on the offensive end. So she was hungry for her first championship, and we just could not match, you know, that intensity. what they brought. Yeah, the intensity. They punched us in the mouth, and they just kept punching, and we was just <laughs> like back on our heels and never did regain our, our footing. And so we learned a valuable lesson. Like, it was quiet in that locker room after the game. Like, you know, especially for myself, because I felt like I didn't play as well as I should have to help my team. But, you know, it definitely helped us prepare for 13. Yeah, the next year. Like, the next year, it was no words. It wasn't name, no motivation needed. <laughs> we didn't have to have no pep talk. Yeah, like, Cheryl came in, did her normal, like, beginning of the season speech, and it was at, we was after it. Right that was it. That's what's up. So that that would motivate. That's that's the straight hole motivation for the next season to win the championship. Yeah, yeah for sure, for sure. Um, we wanted to reel off a back to back because it hasn't been done since the Sparks did it in the early two thousands. So we was like, man, if we can reel off four, that'll you know put us up there with the Comets. If we can get us a back to back in there, yeah. that'll put us up there with the Sparks. And then we, you know, we up there. We might be able to talk about being, you know, the the team. But, you know, it didn't happen like that. We ended up getting a four, but nothing will never will ever compare to what the comments then reeling off four in a row. Like right. that, I don't even know if that'll ever happen again. But you know, just to be in the the same breath as a team like that, as a player, as players like that, it means a lot to to all of us. Up. Tell me, tell me how it is for you to, you know, spend 14, 14 years with, with one organization and then you have to, you know, you leave and you go from Minnesota to L.A. How was that for you? Yeah, I mean, the 14 years was amazing. Obviously, what, eight or eight or 10 of those years, we, you know, went on an amazing run. My time in Minnesota, like prior to getting there, my draft night, we flew, I flew out right after that. I remember the media asking me questions about what you know about Minnesota. I, I knew absolutely nothing. Yeah. I didn't know the home of Prince. I didn't know the land of 10,000. Like, I knew nothing. But over my 14 years, I, I grew to learn a lot, of, uh, a lot about it. I gained a lot of knowledge about that city, about the place, a lot about the fans. Um, and they embraced me, you know, being there, putting, putting my all into the game, even in the years when we were losing, you know, they embraced that. So that was a wonderful journey. But then it was like a bittersweet ending. Um, as we know, biz, how business is, um, can be. Uh, it's just unfortunate I had to learn that at that moment. And so making that transition to L.A. was tough because we, I mean, technically we was rivals. 16, 17, we going back and forth competing for a championship and we looking to beat them. And now I'm like, well, what I'm going to do, you know, now I got to make a decision. I could have went back to Minnesota, but it was still like, you know, some ill feelings. Like I, I felt, you know, hurt a little bit. And it's like, can I still go there and perform and be myself? And so L.A. was the team that that was the front runners. You know, they they came in and was like, yo, we would love to have you. I didn't know what my role would be. Obviously, I'm very smart about where I'm at in my career, a lot older. I still get out there and get a few buckets and everything, but more than anything, it was probably going to be, you know, mentorship, just right. staying in younger players' ears and, and trying to help them uh, grow to become the team that the Sparks hope to be in the near future. So um, I felt like it was a great fit for on-court and possibly off-court opportunities as I, you know, transition off the court. I know what I want to ask. I got, I like, you know, I'm that guy. Even though you said you didn't, you know, you didn't move up in the tax bracket, you know, when you got your money, when you got your money, I see you like shoes and stuff like that. I'm a shoe, me and D-Mile love shoes. What did you do 
when you got yourself a nice little, you know, you got your nice, nice pocketbook money, you, you know, you ain't killing me, but you got a nice little pocketbook money where you go treat yourself. What did you do to treat yourself? Did, did you look back on like, ah, it might not have been, you know, I wouldn't probably do that now, but I appreciated the hell out of it when I did it back then as a youngin. Nah, you know, I did exactly what I said I wanted to do. I had I had an uncle that just like, he had a bunch of old schools. He had, you know, lived his life. He was chilling, chilling at home, get up every morning, lift weights, do his thing, drive around his old school. And I was like, I'm gonna be like Uncle Harold one day, you know? And when I was able to get my, get my money up and stash my cash, um, I went and got the same car Uncle Harold had. He had a, a 1968 um, Impala Supersport convertible. Ooh. And so I went and got that same car and just, you know, did my thing on it. And I would just ride around. I was like, oh, man, I felt good. <laughs> I still have that car now. <laughs> you know, I still have that car. So I didn't really go and buy, like, crazy stuff, like, stuff that didn't have any value to me now. Like, I, you know, classic car, you can always be able to sell and make a little money off of it. So uh, yeah. when you drove the old school car, I know when I used to drive my old school, I, I just yeah. had to play old school. Not, Pat, not. He thought he was baby Snoop, everybody. I he had to play that bouncing. Play that pussy in my old school. So you did you stick <laughs> with the old school music too, or you, you kept the new school music? Nah, you know, we from BR, so we was bumping that Boosie and Webby back in the day. <laughs> we had to go hard. <laughs> yeah, you had to go hardcore if you was going to ride in your old school. Sundays now, that's me and Pops. We would hop in there and we would ride in here, put Al Green and, you know, some of that yeah, old school. Yeah. But when I was in there, I kept it straight gutter. We were straight BR, BR's finest, the little Boosie, Webby, and anybody else at that time. <laughs> so when you came up, like, I know you love basketball, but who's the the women basketball players that you've seen from afar? Like I know you mentioned Shamika Holdclaw, but who's the women that you've seen before that you was kind of looking at and trying to take like some patent some of your game after or be like, man, I want to be like her. Man, I know people don't say her enough, but Teresa Edwards. Like yes. she was a hooper. And I actually got to be coached by her. Um with at, at the Lynx, she was um one of our assistant coaches one year with the Lynx, and she was like, "You remind me a lot of me," because sometimes it took me to get mad or angry in the game. Maybe somebody pushed me, talked some trash to me, ref blew a bad call for me to just like then go to work. And she was like, "That's the stuff that I would do. Like I would just wait and then go." She was like, "You just got to go out there from the tip." She was like, "If that's what you need, find something that pisses you off before the game." And then you're ready for the game or whatever. But I just always admired her, you know, intensity on the floor. Like, she has some stuff with her game. Like, she has some stuff with her. Like, she can do a little bit of everything. And then the fact that I just like that no back down type thing. Like, she ain't back down for many people. And, like, watching them old school games, I ain't, you know, I, I don't remember. I think she might have broke birdie nose one game. Like, not on purpose, I don't believe, but it's just, like, her aggressiveness. She like, yo, get off me. <laughs> yeah, so I always appreciated her, her game. Not your top five, but your favorite five. Your favorite five women's players that you love to watch. Like, who is your favorite five? All right, I said T. Edwards, um, D.T. Mm -hmm. um, dang, see, y'all put me in a, because it's so, like, ah, y'all put me. This ain't LG. your top five. This is just, this ain't the this top five. This is my top, your okay, you said, five. You ain't right. your favorite five. It's strictly your oh, opinion. You like to watch you the best top. top. You ain't in that box. This is just your favorite player. All right. Uh, T.L. was D.T., Cappy, Lauren Jackson. Ooh, Keller. Um, what is that? That's, what, three, four? Yeah. I got one more. Um, y'all got me going through. You know what? I used to like it, 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 K Law didn't get celebrated a lot in our league, but Carol Lawson, Carol like Lawson. flying off of them screens in in her early days in Sacramento, like that technique was almost similar to what you witnessed with Golden State and Clay Thompson and, and uh Steph Curry. She was solid. <laughs> yeah. I love to watch her footwork. Catch, if you're not there, it's up. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think those players. All right, start bench cut. Now this is what he trying to get start you in trouble. You got a bench one, you got a cut one. <laughs> uh, Diana Taurasi, Cappy Poindexter. Poindexter. 
And Teresa. I know. <laughs> uh, start binge cut. Um, oh, man, you got me. <laughs> All right, I'm going to have to. Um, Dang, I'm gonna start DT bench cap cut T. <laughs> that sounds like it hurt to say. <laughs> it did. It really did. You can't get in no trouble for this start bench cut. We gonna. I see you a sneaker here. You got your J's back there. Salute, right. Team Jordan strong. So start bench cut Air Jordan one, Air Jordan three, and retro eleven. Start bench cut. Oh man. Those are just three of my like favorite. Them three of your faves. All right. Start start the ones, bench the elevens, cut the threes. Oh, you got okay. See, I'm with her. I'm with her. The ones gotta be. It's too many ones. It don't matter what they come out with. The ones can go with any and every type of outfit and any and every type of color. It don't matter. So the one has to be the one. And they broke the mold with it. They broke the mold with it. <laughs> I wear them on a daily, and like when I'm trying to figure That's out. That's gonna tell you, it don't matter what's going on. The ones you could just pull out any type of ones, and they gonna go with anything that you could come up with. I'm telling you. Yeah. Yep. Tell me this. Tell me this. So you you didn't want you know three gold medals in the Olympic games, but how how did it feel to to be on that top twenty at twenty list? You know, what I'm saying top twenty WNBA players ever to be, you know, part of that, the original first ever list. How did that make you feel? Yeah, I remember, Um, I think it was a 15 list that came out before and I wasn't on that one. And I remember sitting down with Coach Reeve and she was like, um, why do you think you're not on this list? And I looked at everybody and most everybody had like a championship and, you know, some other big time awards. And I was like, "I," but I just straight went to the championships. And she was like, well, what do you want your legacy to be? Like at this point, you can change the trajectory of what your career and what your legacy will be from this point on. And so that's what I was working for that next, what, five years until they made the next list. That's what my game was about, what my legacy was gonna be. And so to then get to the 2020, uh, to top 20 list and see my name on there, I was like, you know, it was gratification, like all the work that I had did, the, you know, everything that I had done to get to that point and to see my name on the list with all these legends, to be able to stand out there while we taking pictures. And I'm like, like, damn, I'm a legend too. Right, like, right. You know, you, I'm like, <laughs> yeah, like you, you can't yeah. process. I was still early in my career at that point too, but I was like, damn, like these, these women like really did this. They paved the way for me. And now I'm sitting up here enjoying a piece of the pie with them, you know? Right. All right, that's been a wrap. We appreciate it. This has been Hughes with the Baton Rouge legend, a.k.a. Money Moan, a.k.a. Top 20 WNBA all-time soon to be in the Hall of Fame when, whenever she gets done and get ready. But we appreciate you. This was major. Salute to you. Appreciate you for coming on with us. Thank you.